welcome to the Prince Soft Cover. We have with us today Nainika Mathur, and we're going to be discussing her book Crooked Cats: Beastly Encounters in the Anthropocene, published by HarperCollins. So Nainika Mathur is a professor of anthropology and South Asian studies at Wilson College at the University of Oxford. This is her second book. The first was Paper Tiger: Law, Bureaucracy, and the Developmental State in Himalayan India. So the Anthropocene, for anyone who may not be familiar with the term, is the time in Earth's history that we're living in today, which is when human activity has had a significant impact on the pl planet's climate and environmental ecosystems. Uh, and the book looks at the interactions between humans and big cats in the context of climate change. So welcome to the print. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me and for, uh, and for doing this dig digital launch. So the first question I want to ask you has to do with the adjective that you use to describe cats who turn predatory towards human beings. You choose to call them crooked, which is a softer, it's a more gentler term um, than say man-eater or the more popular terms that you would use to describe those kinds of cats. So why do you choose to do, use this term? And where do you think this crookedness arises from? Is it is it a survival mechanism, you know, in, in the context of climate change or is it sort of an anomaly or a result of the context in which these cats come from? Uh, thank you for this question. Um, so, you know, I use the term crooked cats and I prefer them over the, the conventional term man-eaters or Adam Kaur, uh for a range of reasons. And I'll just very quickly list uh, them here. So I think the first is uh, one of the big objectives of this book is to get away from more uh, standard understandings of big cats that turn predatory. Um, and these, as I argue in the book, come from either sort of colonial discourses of the Shikar story, or they come from a very, very staunchly conservationist position in contemporary India, or they come from this very um, status discourse of how you manage and regulate big cats. Um, and, you know, and the term man -eaters, whether this is in, again, in colonial accounts, whether this is in the ways in which um, stridently conservationist uh, NGOs or, or reports talk about them, or the, the way in which the post-colonial state writes about them in state manuals, in the law, etc. Um, and I find this category over-determined because of that. Um, but I also find that the term man -eater, so one of the objectives of this book is to get away from all these ways of looking at these big cats. I'm trying to actually understand big cats um, as an anthropologist, as an ethnographer, as someone who's been working in Uttarakhand for a long time and has, um, and also in other parts of India, but particularly in Uttarakhand. And I'm trying to, what I'm trying to do in the book is actually talk about how people who live in close proximity to such big cats write about them, or not write about them, how they talk about them and how they experience, uh, you know, living with these sort of beastly presences, so to say. Um, in that, I found the term man -eater was just not doing the work that I wanted these stories to do for me in this book. Um, and, you know, I remember early in my research, somebody once said to me uh, that, you know, I, when I was asking them about such a leopard who was actually haunting the town I was then living in, and he said, you know, most big cats are sidha sadha, they're simple, they're straightforward, uh, but some of them become teda, they go crooked. Um, and he said, and we don't know why this happens. But because, you know, you'll have like 20 leopards in this area, but only one of them will be a quote unquote man eater. And the question then he opened out was like, but why is that happening? Right. And this was a question, the same question that you asked me here that, you know, what leads to this crookedness? Why do certain specific big cats become crooked? Is something that I led with in my interviews and doing my field work saying that, so why do you think this is happening? And what I found really interesting in, in the answer to that question was that people didn't necessarily talk about the animal or they didn't necessarily blame the animal itself. So the tiger or the leopard, but they would blame other kinds of human made structures or you, you know, particular kinds of individuals. So they would talk about the role of politics. They would talk about the role of the state. They would talk about, um, you know, the ways in which uh, humans are sort of destroying the environment. They're like cutting down forests, building big dams. Uh, they're stealing the resources of the Himalaya. Um, they're not leaving space for these particular big cats to actually live and exist the way they used to previously. Um, and so I found this constant turn to to human structures and processes and actions really telling. 
And so I decided to call the book Crooked Cats and all through the book, as, as you would have noticed, I don't use the term man eater other than when I'm quoting from, say, Jim Corbett's stories or I'm quoting from the government of India's legal doctrines on what how one manages such big cats. Because I think that the term crooked opens out uh, this question of why they become crooked, how do we understand them? It allows us to actually center other kinds of stories about uh, big cats that have become crooked. So, you know, again, I'm seeing this a lot in already I'm seeing this the book has just been released recently in India, of course. Um, and I'm already seeing that there's this constant turn to this category of man to, to describe it or talk about it. And, and I feel like saying, no, I mean, I, I want to drop that. I want to think of them through a very different term, a different terminology to open up this question that you that you also posed here, which is that what makes them crooked? Um, so if I can come to that part of your question, you know, what, what is this, where is this crookedness coming from? Um, I, I think I wouldn't have one answer. And, you know, and again, I'm building this on what people have said to me or what my interlocutors have been saying. I think there's no one definitive answer why big cats become crooked. Um, and there are lots of theories and speculations uh, that people sort of propound. And I write about them. I have a chapter called Crooked Becomings where I actually go through sort of a range of theories on why this might be happening. Um, and I want to use this moment to say that because I don't have a definitive answer why big cats become crooked, uh, that isn't a shortcoming of the work, but actually I think it's a strength because normally people have very, very firm ideas of why, why this is happening. And what I do here is I offer out lots of, understandings of it. Uh, but perhaps the only definitive thing I will say is that the planetary crisis that, you know, has has to be written into this. So again, something I'm trying to do in this book, which I think is different from the ways in which big cats have been understood previously, is that, you know, the very localized or regional answers given or biological answers, uh, or, you know, very um, contingent answers that are given to this question of why big cats become crooked. And I think those are very important and we need to have them in the story. But I also think that this wider framing of this moment that we're living in, which as you very rightly pointed out in the beginning is this epoch called the Anthropocene where we can't think about um, very micro uh, aspects of what's say happening in one district in Uttarakhand or what's happening in Bombay outside this planetary crisis. And that's again, um, something that I'm trying to do in this book. I'm trying to shift the frame of understanding crooked cats. Um, to think about the climate crisis, to think about how we can't understand changing human-animal relations in this moment outside this planetary crisis. So that brings me to my second question, which is the book's central claim is that, you know, climate change is likely to bring with it more uh, crooked cats who are more crooked than before. Um, and one question I have is, you know, what, what is that before? Uh, but also, you know, how do you discern those very local factors um, that may influence the displacement or, or otherwise yeah. of big cats from, yeah. you know, the overarching influence of climate change? Um, in the book, you look at three specific places. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you look at Shimla, you look at Dehradun, you look at Mumbai. So, you know, how do you, uh, and, and all of those landscapes are very different from one another. Those interactions are also very different. So you know, how do you, how do you discern, I guess, the local from, from the global mm -hmm. and from the larger influences of climate change? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. Um, and, you know, I think that is, again, one of the big struggles that one faces in talking about climate change, because we're talking about it at a planetary scale or at a larger scale, but actually the impacts that we see are very, very localized, right? And so how do you do the scale shifting? Like, how do you go from this local, from this minute village and what's happening there to think about deep time, to think about the planetary structure, et cetera? Um, and I also think this other point that you raise about the before and the after is really important that, you know, how, do, how does one have a timeline for, well, this is the way it used to be, Berlin, now it's become like this. Um, so the answer I'll give you is going to be like what a typical anthropologist would give, which would be that I'm going to say that I'm not going to say what I particularly think about this, but I'll say what I'm arguing in the book, but also what I think um, I, I can sort of see ethnographically or through, through this sort of fieldwork that I've been doing. Um, so let me begin with the question on time, which you said that what was this before and then what is the after, and you know, we can see more crookedness uh, coming. And then I'll come to the other bit of scale shifting from the local to the planetary that you've said. On the question of time, I would say that um, 
you know, when I started writing this book, and I, in fact, I remember the first round of reviews that this book got, uh, the anonymous reviews from the press, one of the reviewers was like, well, this has nothing to do with climate change. Why is she going on about this, right? There have always been man eaters in India. You can see there's a long history to this. And what is all this newfangled nonsense about the Anthropocene and climate change, et cetera. Um, and this is like a few years back because, you know, these academic books take years and years to be published. Mm-hmm. And I just remember sitting there and reading that review and being like absolutely flabbergasted because this person was just not understanding how real the climate crisis is in the Himalaya, right? In ways that actually we can't look away from now, from all these climate disasters that we've seen, or we've seen what's happening in Pakistan right now with one third of the country submerged underwater. Um, You can't disassociate all these little, little things, not that that's little, but you can't dissociate everyday life in, in India not just in India, anywhere in the world from climate change anymore. But even three, three years back, I think when I got these reviews, this person was like, but they've always been man eaters, right? What is the difference here? So my answer to him and something I stress in the book as well uh, was that actually one thing I do in this book is I take very seriously the claims that my interlocutors make, which is that there always used to be, no one is saying that leopards and tigers and lions were not predatory earlier. Um, and, you know, especially this question of these leopards in, in Uttarakhand has been a problem for a long time. And, you know, we can see this in colonial accounts, we can see this in the archive, we can see this in stories. But I take very seriously the claim that my interlocutors make, which is that they are getting more and more crooked, that it is getting harder and harder. They're entering places that they would not enter into. They're acting in ways that are increasingly unpredictable. Um, And we cannot understand this in a localized fashion. We cannot understand why, um, you know, animals are coming further and further into human habitations. Normally they would just try to avoid them. Right. And actually, part of the question is that it's actually humans who are like increasing their settlements and going into areas that they didn't earlier. So, you know, this idea of what is human land and what is non-human land is also sort of um, collapsing in this moment. Um, Just yesterday, I was reading the study which said that, uh, which is doing this camera trapping exercise outside Delhi, talking about how leopards have now uh, entered, you know, and are living quite happily and you know, quite peacefully with humans on the outskirts of Delhi. And this is a new phenomenon that we're seeing. Um, and so, so my basic point is that I take very seriously what people in the Pahar would tell me, which is that, you know, we can't live in this village anymore because these leopards are getting so badmash. They're so data. They're so chatur. They're so cunning. They come into these spaces. They're taking our children. They're taking our livestock. Um, it's impossible. And I've now been working in Uttarakhand for 15 years myself because I started there in 2006 when I began my PhD and um, and this book has its origin in that. And I can really see the difference myself. If you talk to, even if you look at uh, government uh, government stats, you can see that there is an upswing in attacks by leopards and tigers, that there is more predatory behavior. Um, Also the spread of social media, the use of smartphones, you know, so again, I'm sure all of you see on WhatsApp, you'll get these videos of these leopards in these urban areas, you will get, you keep hearing stories of attacks, etc. And I think I take this very seriously. This is not, I can't clinically prove that in the last 200 years, there has been a particular trend with this. I, we just don't have the data for that. And that's also not the kind of book that this is. This is a book that takes seriously people's accounts of how they live uh, in the mountains, how they live with non-humans. And it centers that as a form of knowledge, as an important form of knowledge that we have to take seriously and not disregard. So my, my answer to the before and after would be that this is what my interlocutors have said to me, and I take that very seriously as a form of knowledge, um, but we can also see it in other kinds of, you know, other forms of knowledge making, whether it is government officials or it is NGO reports, et cetera, or in the increasing um, prevalence of what are called ghost villages in the in Uttarakhand where people are abandoning certain spaces. One of the reasons that's often given is the misbehavior of animals, whether it is leopards or wild boars or monkeys, and the kind of you know, crooked behavior that they're seeing there, which is not possible anymore to be handled uh, like that. So I think that's my my answer to the before and after. The question of scale, I think is a really important one, right? So this question of, um, and so that's something I explored in the chapter that you talked about, Big Cats in the City, where I compare three different cities, there are Shimla and Mumbai, uh, and show that they have very different responses to the presence of big cats. Um, and my answer in that, and I actually did that comparative study for precisely the reason you know, that you spelled out here in your question to me, which is that why is it that you have the same animal 
uh, and you know, and they they elicit very different responses in different places. It's very clear that in different places, places have particular histories, they have particular ecologies, they have particular politics. Uh, there is a way in which people come together to organize. There is a role that the state plays in it. There is a role that ecological history um, or charismatic individuals play in it, and this really shapes how human animal uh, encounters go. Uh, So, for instance, uh, if I can use the example of Mumbai, which is quite well documented, um, there's been uh, around Aare Colony uh, in Mumbai, there has been, you know, there have been sort of moments of conflict and then downswings in conflict between humans and leopards. And this has been very wonderfully documented by Mumbai Curse for SGNP, Sanjay Gandhi National Park, uh, which is sort of a state and um, community led initiative where they sort of came together to actually really try to understand these leopards and work with them and try to come up with uh, solutions to reducing uh, these conflicts. And they have really documented well. I've learned a lot from their work. Um, And what I find very striking with that is the ways in which changes in human behaviors has allowed for changes in leopard behavior in the sense that because humans are coming together and saying, okay, let's try to understand what's happening here and let's um, handle, let's change the way in which we regard big cats and the ways in which we deal with them, that has led to a drop in conflict. Um, In places like Dehradun, it's surprisingly, it's surprising how you don't see such initiatives, but rather you see a very, to my mind, very colonial approach to it, where you see a leopard and then you're like, okay, let's just kill it. You know, let's be like Jim Corbett and let's do, or like any of the shikaris and let's just hunt it down. And I link that in the book to a particular history of the city, but also history of the space, um, of the ways in which there are very powerful legacies of uh, of empire that sort of stay on through very charismatic individuals, um, through a particular culture of Sarkar, uh, and that, and you can see that in everyday practice. So what I try to show in this book is actually um, how important the local actually is to this, right? So of course we talk about uh, the climate crisis at a planetary scale, and a lot of what we're talking about here really has to do with human actions globally over deep time. But there is so much of it is also down to how humans shape politics and landscapes. Hmm. And it's interesting that you talk about that because that that's also another question that came to my mind. Um, a very interesting sort of insight that you offer is that in Uttarakhand. Um, conflicts, I know you don't like the word, but um, of this nature, uh, you you kind of hypothesize that they're higher because of this Jim Corbett legacy. And you also talk about intergenerational memory of of the cats themselves. Um, So how do you, I mean, how do both of those things play out? And, you know, how how did you kind of uh, link the two uh, to, to come to your own insights regarding that? Thanks. Yeah. So, you know, something that I figured out while I was doing this research and thinking about this work is really how important history is um, and the ways in which the past stays on in the present in very small but very meaningful ways. And you pointed to two examples here. Um, So let me begin with perhaps a second one on intergenerational memory. Um, So one of the debates which we are having in animal studies, uh, but not just in the social science and humanities, but also in sort of uh, animal behavior, you know, animal emotions from a more natural science perspective is, do animals have memory? Like, can they remember? Can they transmit knowledge to one another? Um, Can they teach, uh, you know, can can a tiger mom teach her cub something? Or is there a way in which across generations of animals, um, do they retain a sense of memory or um, knowledge or intergenerational something, right? And these are fascinating debates and you're not sort of going on and every every now and then you have these studies which will be like, yes, your dog understands you like this when you do this and you know your cat does this and all that. Um, but what I found really interesting during my fieldwork was that people in the bar would be like, of course they have memory, of course they have kinship structures. Of course, they have ways of transferring knowledge one to the other. And I mean, it wasn't even necessarily a question. You know, it wasn't something that they were particularly speculative about. So one of the very prominent theories on why big cats become crooked is is actually linked to intergenerational knowledge and memory. So one of the theories is that, you know, if you hunt a species a lot, uh, so you're hunting down, say, leopards, which happens a lot in 
Uh, unfortunately, it happens a lot despite it being illegal. It happens not just with the so-called crooked cats because the shikari comes and kills them, but there's also, as we know, poaching and trafficking of animals across the border. And there's a lot of sort of illegal hunting that goes on even now. Uh, again, very hard to document or to prove, but you know, we sort of know this um, through through our through sort of stories and rumors, etc. Um, and so one of the theories is that because there has been so much hunting historically, as well as even now of big cats, they as a species have turned on humans. So, you know, and not just as a species, but also particularly individuals remember that, for instance, my you know grandfather was killed by humans and hence they've turned on them. Another important sort of theory in Uttarakhand is that because it has a long border with, uh, with China and Nepal and a lot of the cross-border trafficking of poached animals goes through these borders. Uh, in these areas, there is a high level of big cats that have become crooked because they're so angry about what's happening to them as a species and you know the ways in which they're being treated. Um, very interestingly, there are also studies from North America which shows that the more you hunt cougars, the more uh, they turn on humans, right? And so it's a very, and you can't make that correlation scientifically, but th there are these studies which are showing this, that the more violence you show towards a particular kind of species, the more they turn on you, um, they as a species. But there are also these stories of individual retribution or individual memories of a specific leopard. So, you know, I remember this story, this woman told me about how she was one day working in the field many years back and accidentally she sort of hit with her sickle, she uh, injured a little leopard cub who was sitting right there. And uh, thankfully the cub was not too badly injured, but basically what it did was that uh, the poor thing, uh, he became lame and, you know, after that. And she says that, you know, when this leopard grew up, she would go to the farm, back to the same farm and she'd be working there and she would see this leopard would come and watch her. Mm -hmm. And she knew it was the same one because he limped a little. And, and, you know, and she, she was just like, he never hurt her and she knew that he never would hurt her, but he would watch her to sort of tell her that, look, I am the one that you hurt, but I know you did it accidentally, so I'm not going to hurt you. You know, this is just one story. I could go on and on about stories of how people talk about individual tigers or leopards, but the point is that what they're talking about here is this capacity for memory, for emotion, for affect, for understanding ideas of justice or what is right, what is wrong, um, that individual animals have, but they also carry it across. The other is, of course, the, the figure of, you know, uh, of the shikari. And again, you know, it's impossible to write about crooked cats without, especially if you work in Uttarakhand, without this constant evocation of Jim Corbett as the ultimate person who wrote on the man eaters and, um, you know, and I find like I grew up like many of us, I think, did reading Jim Corbett's stories and being thrilled by them. And, you know, he's a masterful storyteller in a way, just the way in which he captures landscapes, the way he talks about tigers and lepers, the way he talks about the shikar. Um, it's actually beautifully done. He's a very, very good writer. And in some ways, I'm almost envious of the, the hold that his stories have, because actually these are stories at the end of the day, right, that he's written. And I don't mean that they're not fact or the fiction. I don't want to go to that debate here, though I do explore it a bit in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, but what they are is that the particular narratives on man eaters and who they are and how one deals with them. But what I do sort of take from Corbett are two things. One is the power of storytelling. And the ways in which if you tell a story well, it lives on and it shapes your imagination, it shapes the way in which we think, the way in which we look at the world, the way in which we understand non-humans, the way in which we understand the landscape of the environment that we live in. Mm -hmm. I take that from Corbett quite seriously. Um, but the other thing which I take from him, which is you know much more critical, I think, is that Corbett's hold in both the state apparatus as well as outside, especially in Uttarakhand, is very, very marked. So, you know, just as an example, you can see that a lot of the licensed hunters, uh, the licensed shikari, so what the state now does is that it gives licenses to particular hunters uh, who are then authorized to go and hunt quote unquote man eaters. But that said, there are only certain kinds of licensed shikaris who can now do this work. Um, 
you know, in, in, in Uttarakhand, they will tell you straight out, they're like, oh, yeah, I, I model myself on COVID. I'm a mini COVID. I think of myself as COVID junior, right? And, you know, the way they dress, the way they talk, their own stories about themselves is so deeply modeled on someone like COVID mm-hmm. that I find that fascinating. Uh, but also, not just that. So you have, on one hand, you have the shikaris. But on the other hand, you have this sort of culture of Sarkar, the Sarkari culture where even within the forest department, um, you can see that there is a way in which COVID and holds a sway. It's almost like his ghost is, you know, pervading the corridors of power and Dehradun and, you know, et cetera, even now, because of the way in which they, they respond to leopards, right? And it's a very similar response to what COVID had, which is that these are beautiful animals and it is a shame that we have to kill them, but there are some that become man-eaters and we have to just kill them because there's no other way around it, right? And and I think that culture of shikar, that culture of how you deal with them, it sort of seeps in from this very powerful role that Corbett has in in the space. So I remember when I went to uh, Bombay, to Mumbai for the first time, and I started doing some field work there, I was really struck by how even the term man-eater is not used in the same way in Maharashtra. And when they use it, they use it very sparingly, right? Because, and and also like this sort of critical stance that was taken on corporate stories that I saw amongst uh, a lot of people there, including government officials, was a, such a relief because when you're in other parts of, uh, especially the mountains, you know, you see even the most intelligent, critical person is not critical of what Corbett at his heart, at the root of it was doing, right? And so to come back to my earlier thing, I think it's because he is such a beautiful storyteller. It's also because, of course, his heart was in the right place. He did turn out to be one of the first conservationists. He did foresee, um, you know, a very, uh, well, a bit late in his life, but okay, he did see it. He did see the coming extinction of tigers and leopards. Um he, he cared for them in very interesting ways. He had a beautiful way of telling the story. So, you know, and of course, Corbett was a man of his times, right? So this is not a, I was reading a review recently of a book where someone was like, she's scathing an attack on Jim Corbett. And I was like, no, I'm not. Like, that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm, I'm actually just trying to think of what is the legacy, the afterlife of, of this man that we can see in this moment, right? And why is it important? Um, and how do we need to shift that? So um, you also say that there is a need for radical reform when it comes to the governance of big cats. So can you walk us through why you think so? What are some of the flaws in the current systems in place to govern these conflicts? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So, you know, I, as you said, my first book was on bureaucracy. Um, and this was also set in Uttarakhand. And it was all about law and bureaucracy in Uttarakhand. And so when I started this work, this research, I was like, I'm done with talking about governance and bureaucracy in the state. I'm now working on animals and uh, climate change and, and the Anthropocene and multi-species work. And this is very different. And actually what I found so striking as I start, I, I got further and further into the research is that you can't get away from the state. You can't get away from governance structures and legal structures in India because they actually really are important. Uh, so, you know, what I call the government of big cats is actually shaping so much of human non-human interactions. It is so vital to understand how how non-humans are governed and regulated and how they're protected or not protected as the case might be to even try to come to some partial understanding of the place of big cats in India today. Um, so um, so I got very interested in this whole question of governance. And in the book, uh, as you know, I have three significant chapters that look at them. The first one is where I look at um, these theories around why they become crooked. And I have this whole uh, section over there on, on government accounts of why this happens and what should be done if this happens. So the guidelines and the laws and the, you know, the several commissions and committees that have been set up to govern the cats and some of the flaws in them, which I'll just come to in a minute. Uh, But then I also have the section on identifying big cats. So how do you come to identify quote unquote, a man eater as the one that is the the guilty one, so to say, among, you know, in a landscape where you have several big cats operating at the same time, how do you know that? Um, Then I have a section on petitions and it's called a petition to kill. And it's really about how uh, people sort of petition the state uh, to 
to regulate and govern the cats and how most of these petitions are binned or, you know, they're never really read. But there are a few petitions here and there that become successful, that become efficacious in the sense that they elicit a response. And I'm interested in thinking about why certain petitions work while the vast majority of them do not work. What I sort of then, um, so why I think that, um, why I think that the government of cats is really important is because firstly, it's absolutely central to questions of endangerment and extinction and conservation, and we can't look away from them. I think the focus for too long has been on the work of NGOs, or it has been to, uh, you know, which are also sort of a bit, not all of them, there's some really excellent NGOs working this area. But I, I think that a lot of these international NGOs or the sort of uh, slightly um, remote kinds of elite um, organizations that are much more interested in preserving big cats and have less interest in thinking about the humans that actually coexist with them. Um, and actually they have this very problematic uh, idea, which is that the only way to save tigers and leopards is that you rid these spaces of human habitations. Mm -hmm. So you have these vast displacement programs. You see that anytime there's an attack by, uh, or there's some sort of quote unquote conflict or any kind of disturbances, they blame humans and they try to rid these spaces of humans, right? And this is a very, very problematic model because in India and South Asia, you can't actually have animals living in some beautiful sanctuary completely separated out from humans. Um, it's just not possible. But also if it's, I mean, historically humans have coexisted with, you know, with the most endangered animals and it has been fine. They have not actually... Um, this has not led to problems. It has not necessarily led to trouble. So the problem is not that the humans in that area, there are other issues there which should be looked at, but it becomes easy for some of these elite NGOs or these conservationists or these elite conservationists or these tiger lovers to come out and say, you know, let's just get rid of all these villages from here. Let's just displace all the Adivasis. Let's make this a pure space for a big cat. I mean, that's just not possible. And it's horrible when you think about the history of what's been happening in India with that. So I'm very critical of that kind of elite conservationism that is not taking into account the fact that humans and non-humans actually coexist quite well um, and actually then looks to displace humans out of these spaces and prioritize the lives of uh, charismatic non-humans, especially the tiger. So one is that, but the second thing is that, you know, I think something that's quite clear, especially from my work on bureaucracy and working with local government, uh, governance regimes is that there are these laws, these universal laws national laws and regulations that come for all of India. And as I show through very specific examples, these don't really work in different parts, you know? So you really need uh, to have a more decentralized approach to it. You need to be a bit more trusting of actually uh, of humans, of, of the fact that not everyone is out there to, you know, to kill a tiger or not everyone is out there to somehow make money off this in some way. Uh, mm -hmm but actually believe in sort of local structures a bit more and decentralize uh, some of the power and also give a bit more space within it uh, for, for, for action uh, at different spaces and places, which isn't there right now because it's a uniform uh, law, the Wildlife Protection Act. It has particular kinds of guidelines that are issued uh, by very specific kinds of people who are based in, you know, in metropolitan areas who have a particular orientation towards especially again, big cats, right? It, this is not just any animal. It's a, the tiger, the national animal of India, et cetera. They have a strong attachment to, to the figure of the tiger, uh, which is again, very classed and uh, mm -hmm. very um, urban based and actually can be quite problematic. And we need to have a, a slightly different approach to studying, uh, to handling and managing them and actually studying them. Okay. All right. So with that, we're out of time. Thank you so much for taking out the time to speak with us. Great. Thank you so much for having me and um, thank you for your questions.